Hello, welcome to this lesson on drawing Bohr diagrams. We are going to draw the Bohr diagram for boron. Now the Bohr diagram is based on the Bohr model of the atom. Um, so what happened with this is that uh, Niels Bohr was trying to fix Rutherford's model of the atom. If you don't remember, Rutherford's model had the um, nucleus as positive because he was shooting those alpha particles and found the very small, dense, positive nucleus. He knew it was positive. And before him, J.J. Thompson had discovered those electrons, which were kind of just floating around. Rutherford didn't put them in place. So Niels Bohr comes in and says, hey, all of these electrons should be attracted to the protons in the nucleus, making the entire thing neutral. It doesn't make sense that this area would remain positive if the negatives weren't locked in a place because otherwise they would just float in and neutralize the nucleus. So he said, we got to do something about this. He does this by putting the electrons in rings that kind of reminded him of our solar system with the sun in the middle surrounded by the planets, right? Uh, this, I mean, our planets are slowly moving into the gravity of the sun, but nothing Nothing significant. So he was figuring, okay, let's do something like that. And then he found evidence to show um, how much energy it would take electrons to move in between these levels, more or less proving that these levels existed. So then came the diagrams to kind of show how this works. So we have boron and boron we know has five protons. So when I draw a Bohr model, I want to indicate that this is boron by indicating that there's five protons. Every atom that has five protons is an atom of boron, so just putting that is enough. Then we need to indicate the number of neutrons that we have. The number of neutrons, in case you don't remember from my last practice video, uh, it's this mass number rounded to a whole number. 10.8 would bring us to 11. That's the mass number or the number of subatomic particles inside the nucleus. We know that because this is boron, five of them are protons. So the six left over must be neutrons. So inside my boron atom, I have six neutrons alongside my five protons. The next thing is going to be to determine the number of energy levels or electron levels that I have in an atom of boron. This um, period number along the edge here is not an accident. Um, the period on the periodic table corresponds to the number of electron energy levels that that particular atom has. In an atom of boron, you can see that it is a member of period two, meaning that boron has two electron levels. Here's the first, and here is the second. Now, because this is an atom of boron, I know that I should have five electrons, but I have to organize those over these two rings. And I'm going to tell you, it's really not that hard to figure it out once you know how to read the periodic table. So this first energy level here, I'm sorry, this first period corresponds to the first energy level in atoms. This is why the periodic table looks the way that it does. I often call it the castle, and this is the skinny tower, and this is the wide tower. Um, so the first period only has two elements in it. And that is because only two electrons fit in that first energy level. Kind of crazy, right? Um, so then boron, we know that the remaining three electrons must fit somewhere in this final energy level because the two plus the three would give me five, but there's an even better way to know this. Using the periodic table, if you count lithium, let me get a different color, lithium, beryllium, and then boron, boron's the third element in the period, meaning that in period two, boron has one, two, three electrons. It's the third one in that period. Additionally, boron is a member of group 13, and all members of group 13 have three valence electrons because um, it's a little bit weird once we get to this section because of the transition metals, but <laughs> they all have three valence electrons. Um, so that's another way that you could determine that boron has those three electrons in its valence shell. If we look at the periodic table, 
all of the members of group one are going to have one valence electron. All the members of group two will have two valence electrons. Um, and then we get to group 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. They are sometimes called 3A, 4A, 5A, etc. because the towers are the A sections and then this is B. I don't see it happening that way very often. I mostly see groups 1 through 18. So that's how I'm going to continue referring to this. The members of group 13 have three valence electrons. The members of group 14 will have four. 15 has five. 16 with six. 17 has seven. And starting right here, helium only has two because helium's really tiny. But the rest of these have eight valence electrons. All right, we're going to look at aluminum, which is another member of group 13 right here. We know that aluminum will have 13 protons. It'll also have 13 electrons. And then we need to take this to figure out the number of neutrons. So I'm going to round that to 27. I will subtract the 13 protons. And that will leave me with 14 neutrons. So I will do that drawing real quick. We have our 13 protons, which are positive. We have 14 neutrons, which are neutral. And then because aluminum is in the third period, I will need to have three rings or three layers of electrons here. So there's one, there's two, and there is three. So now I'll have to take those 13 electrons and distribute them across the three energy levels that we have here. So in the first energy level, it's small. If we put too many electrons in here, they're going to repel each other, which is why nature has decided that two is the magic number for that first energy level. I, we can also know this because there are only two elements in the first period of the periodic table, first electron for hydrogen and then for helium. Then we have in this second period, we have eight elements in total from lithium to neon. If you counted them, there were eight. This is going to remind us that we can fit eight electrons in this second energy level. And if you are counting between the first and second energy level at this point, we will have 10 electrons. That is not enough to make an aluminum atom. So now we will... Um, take a look at aluminum, which is in the third period. So we're up to the third energy level of our Bohr model. And aluminum is a third element in, indicating that we would have three electrons in this valence shell. Two plus eight plus three would give us the 13 in total. But also aluminum is a member of group 13, and all the members of group 13 have three valence electrons. So our Bohr model would look just like this. Now, if I look at lithium, we know lithium has three protons. So I'm just going to cut to the chase here. We got three protons. The mass rounded to a whole number would be seven. Seven minus the three would give us four neutrons. And uh, lithium is right here in period two. So it will have two orbits of electrons. It has three electrons in total because its atomic number is three. It has two in the first energy level. There's hydrogen, here's helium, and then lithium's final electron will be in the second energy level. I know this because it is the first one in that period, but also it is in group one, indicating that it has one valence electron. That is the lesson on drawing Bohr models. I will say um, there is something that's a little bit weird with drawing Bohr models. You really can't draw Bohr models. I mean, you can, but you can't draw Bohr models for things that are bigger than calcium. And the reason for that is because once we get to the transition metals, we have this thing that's called the D shift. Uh, this green section of the periodic table is called the D block and they kind of mess things up for our electrons. We'll practice more about that later. Really what this means is that these electrons don't behave like the other electrons on the periodic table. And even though scandium, let's say SC, is in the fourth energy level, 
it has extra electrons in the third energy level. Um, so it gets a little bit weird. It's not impossible to draw Lewis structures that are, I'm sorry, it's not impossible to draw Bohr models that are this big. But if we were to say, draw the Bohr model for, uh, I don't know, iodine. If I were drawing for iodine, I would have to have um, 53 protons and, wow, 74 neutrons. And then I would have to have five rings of energy levels. And remember the valence electrons, the very last shell of electrons, those are the only ones that matter. So iodine would have seven in this last level. Uh, seven. Okay. Those are the only ones that bond. So as these get bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, there's this guy and his name is Lewis. I don't remember his first name. His last name is Lewis. He comes up with better pictures to draw these things, especially as they get bigger. Um, so that will be the next practice video, just so that we're, we're um, doing the best pictures for the elements that we are given. The Bohr models, they're good for when you're learning, but truthfully, chemists don't really use them because they get ridiculous. I mean, imagine drawing one of these for uranium with 92 protons, 92 electrons, six energy levels, and I don't even know how many neutrons. A lot. <laughs> it gets crazy. So stay tuned for that video on Lewis structures. If you have any questions on Bohr models, please feel free to leave those questions in the comment section below this video. Subscribe so you don't miss that lesson or that practice on Lewis structures and I'll see you there. Bye.